Hello, I'm Jim Honey. I'm an application engineer at Nexperia. Welcome to this quick learning session. Today we're going to explain how to read a GAN data sheet. Now I'm going to assume you're familiar with data sheets for traditional silicon MOSFETs. I'm going to focus on those parameters which either have a special significance for GAN or are new for GAN FETs. We're going to use this as an example, the Nexperia GAN 063-650WS. That's a 63 milliohm uh, room temperature max. 650 volt GAN power FET. First section is pinning information. Now this device comes in the traditional TO247 package, very familiar to power circuit designers. One thing that's not familiar is the pin assignment. The source is in the center and it's also connected to the mounting base, the tab on the back of the package. Uh, tr conventionally with uh, IGBTs or MOSFETs, this would be the drain or the collector. The reason we do that is to make it easy for you to separate the input and the output loop, to decouple the two, which is important for a high-speed switch. Also in the pinning information is the graphic symbol. And from this, it's immediately obvious that this is, in fact, a two-chip integrated switch. We've combined a normally on high-voltage gallium nitride hemped um, high-electron mobility transistor it's equivalent to, uh, it is a FET, so we'll use the names interchangeably. A low voltage silicon MOSFET developed here at Nexperia specifically for this application. So externally the function is a normally off switch. The silicon device has a PN junction, um, as you expect, that behaves uh, as a body dialed. The GAN hemp has no PN junction. The channel, uh, the current only flows in the channel. In system level schematics where only the external functionality is important, we'll very often show this simplified symbol just to convey this, the idea of the external feature, the external functionality, a end channel normally off that. Okay, limiting values. These are maximums and minimums that you need to stay inside of. If you go outside these boundaries, something bad will happen. Uh, the device might fail, you might activate a degradation mechanism that will shorten the life of the product. So stay within these limits. Right off the bat, we're going to give you one that has a new significance for GAN. This is the drain to source maximum voltage. Now with a silicon MOSFET, you're accustomed to thinking of an avalanche breakdown which will occur slightly beyond the DC rating. So here we're showing leakage current as a function of drain to source voltage. If it's rated at 650, something above 650, you'll expect the current to rise as an avalanche breakdown occurs. GAN has no avalanche multiplication mechanism. So for our devices, um, for the leakage to increase, you have to go well over 1,000 volts. When this leakage does start happening, though, it quickly becomes destructive. This is not a clamping current. Um, but we give a lot of headroom to make it easy for you to avoid going to that voltage level. One other aspect, the avalanche mechanism has a temperature coefficient and the convention is that below 25 degrees C you derate the VDS rating. And this is a typical data sheet shows you this graph and this is just the convention acknowledging the physics of avalanche breakdown. Well since we have no avalanche breakdown, our VDS rating applies over the entire temperature range. So minus 55 to plus 125 650 volts is the DC rating of this device. And I would also say you don't have to derate based on cosmic radiation. That's something some engineers are aware of and concerned with, that they should apply a derating factor. Again, that's associated with an avalanche breakdown mechanism. Since there is none, uh, there's no reason to derate the device. 650 volts really is a voltage it can operate at. In terms of a transient rating, this is a new parameter the transient drain to source voltage. And we specify this um, as one microsecond or less, 10% duty cycle or less, repetitive transient over voltage of 800 volts. If, if we go back, you can see that here at 800 volts, we're really not in danger of breaking the device. And so we will permit repetitive transients. And the idea here is if you have some resonance in your circuit that gives you an overshoot, if it's within these boundaries, that is an acceptable um, amount of over voltage. 
And keep in mind, there is no clamping, so there's no question of avalanche energy. It's just a transient, more you can think the energy is reflected off of the device. Okay, transient drain source voltage. Now there's a whole section of characteristics defining how the device operates in its intended operating conditions. The on resistance is one which you would think is familiar, but actually for GAN it's important to understand this as a dynamic variable. So this is the resistance you will achieve in your actual switching circuit. And when we test it, we use a circuit like this where we have it off for an extended period, turn it on and immediately measure the drain to source voltage and from that calculate the on resistance. So that's how we test it, that's what we guarantee. The reason for doing this is GAN has a well-known uh, capability of trapping charge and if the manufacturer hasn't done a good job then the on resistance you experience when you're switching will be significantly higher than what you've made measure with say a DC meter. Okay. So we feel like we have done a very good job with dealing with the dynamic RDS on and when we specify an on resistance this is what you will in fact get in your switching circuit. Okay. Dynamic characteristics, we have a, a whole list of the normal or normal looking characteristics. Um, charge, capacitance, delay times. We specify the usual small signal capacitances and we also give the chart of capacitance versus voltage. And because small signal capacitance is not a very useful parameter for switching circuits, the industry has come up with two additional output capacitance parameters, one related to energy and one related to time, to help you evaluate how, your, how the capacitance works in your circuit. And that's understood based on the, uh, the two functions that capacitance tells you. Um, one is it relates charge to voltage and the other is it relates energy to voltage. Okay, so the energy related output capacitance defines a parabola that exactly matches the actual EOSS curve at one specific voltage. So at 400 volts, a capacitance of 180 picofarads will correctly predict 14.4 microjoules, but only at 400 volts. Similarly, if you want to know the output charge, at exactly 400 volts, a value of 300 picofarads will predict 120 nanocoulombs, the same as the actual QOSS charge at that voltage. Now, personally, I would say forget the concept of capacitance, just go straight to these two graphs. We show you energy versus drain to source voltage, output charge versus drain to source voltage. Whatever voltage you're actually working at, find the charge, find the energy from these graphs. There's a section on the source to drain diode. Now when we say diode, the implication is the device is acting in a two terminal mode. So VGS is zero, the gate is connected to the source. Current is going through it in the reverse direction. It's acting like a rectifier carrying freewheeling current. And in this mode, what you see is the voltage of the PN junction of the low voltage silicon MOSFET in series with some resistance associated with the GAN hemped. Right? basically what you would expect to see. All right, there's also charge associated with that and this can be a little confusing and I'll explain why. Um, the recovered charge is defined in, in test standards with this kind of a circuit where you have a device under test carrying a freewheeling current and then the opposite switch will turn on and force a transition at the switching node uh, from low voltage to high voltage and in the process the current in the device under test will change from the freewheeling current to some negative current, current going this way um, up until the point that we're blocking the full DC voltage. Okay. So if you make an integral of this negative current you will get any minority carrier uh, charge that was stored in this device plus any output capacitance charge and it turns out, for our devices, the recovered charge is almost entirely output charge. 
So you see QOSS of 120 nanocoulombs. For this device, we actually didn't measure an appreciable difference, and so we've specified the same number for the recovered charge. Now, the confusion comes in um, if you compare data sheets for other GAN devices. Some manufacturers don't do the two-chip approach, and they'll say since there is no PN junction, there is no minority charge, and they'll put a zero for recovered charge. Okay, given the, the assumption and the understanding, that makes sense, but it does lead to confusion if you compare that to this number, which includes the output charge. And, um, yeah, just as an additional point, if there were minority carrier charge, it would be this part of the curve where the voltage is still positive and constant, meaning we're not charging any capacitance, we're simply removing minority carriers. But like I said, that is actually a very small part of the total charge um, recovered for our GAN FETs. One final point that we put on the data sheet is a recommendation for snubbers. Uh, the first one that we recommend in any case is an RC snubber at the DC link. And what this does is lowers the quality factor of any resonance in the bus. Right? That resonance will act as a load on the high gain amplifier, can lead to instability. The snubber lowers the Q and uh, dramatically improves the stability of the switching. So that's, that's a good recommendation in any case. For very high currents, we'll also recommend an RC snubber at the switching node. <clears throat> now this will increase switching loss and so we only recommend it at high power levels where it is not really an appreciable element of loss but it does improve stability and that's what this chart is showing you is as the switched current increases this is the value of snubber resistance we recommend and then a capacitance that gives an RC time constant of 10 nanoseconds. So again, for high currents, we do recommend using that RC snubber on the switching node. Okay, that's what I wanted to share today regarding reading GAN data sheets. Thanks for listening. If you have questions, uh, look at nextperiod.com and have a good day.